We're coming around the scripture today to a very important subject area. It is the area of believing that God's outpouring of his spirit is present with us right now, today. Let's begin with prayers. We come to this important subject. Father, we come before the name of Jesus. We pray that hearts will be open today to receive from you the work of the Spirit, not deferred off into the future, not an outpouring of uh, some time down the track, not looking back at the past and saying the Spirit of God uh, outpouring was in the past, but an outpouring which is a present day reality in our lives. And I pray that people be blessed as they step out into this area in Jesus' name. The first passage we'll look at is in Proverbs chapter 1. And if we look in Proverbs chapter 1, we find here that when he talks about the outpouring of the Spirit, or the work of the Spirit, that it is not a work of the Spirit which is deferred off into the past or into the future, but is right now. And let's look at this. Proverbs chapter 1, we'll start from verse 5. It says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. Now ask the question, when is a person wise but right now? And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. When does he attain but right now? To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. When do the wise exist? Right now. Why? Because he says that you would be able to understand the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Well, those dark sayings obviously exist right now. So we're coming to a very important um, understanding here, which is the work of the Spirit of God, the outpouring of the Spirit, the outpouring of the work of God is a present time right now outworking. And it's very important that we see that. Verse 23 of Proverbs 1 says, Turn you at my reproof. This is a prophecy about what we see exactly happening today with the latency in period of church history. We see a church that Christ is rebuking and saying, be zealous and repent. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, he says to them. This is a present time message. This is not a message merely for back in the time of the apostles or one day in the future. But it's a message that is present and relevant. Verse 23, turn you at my reproof. When's the turning day? Right now. Behold, I will, it's his will, pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. This is very relevant because it's talking about the word and spirit movement. But the fact here is that if we're going to take very specifically the scripture, that word spirit is with a lowercase s. So when we see in verses 5 and 6, he's talking about, you know, being wise and understanding right now. And verse 23 is telling us that I will pour out my spirit unto you with a lowercase s spirit, meaning that this spirit, or one of the functions of what it is, is about knowledge or wisdom or being wise. Why? Because that's exactly what the prophecy is about. It's about The Word of God is available to you, the Holy Ghost is available to you, so that you become knowledgeable in the things of God. So we are living in a prophetical time when we should know and understand, for example, Bible prophecy. We should know and understand what the Bible teaches, correct interpretation. We should have access to all these things because the Holy Ghost outpouring is here for that knowledge to be unlocked. Let me just quickly mention to you that when Jesus said that the Spirit of God was upon him because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, what he's really saying is, I've got the ability to tell you this word of release. If you acknowledge it or understand it, you will know that I am telling you and, and I am the person for you. That's what Christ was preaching to them, that this is the word of your release. That preaching 
to the poor is actually conveying information. That's what preaching is. So it's prophetical, it's, it's knowledge, it's wisdom, and it has to be understood. The, the Bible also tells us, it says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I also want to mention in passing as well in Ephesians, where Paul prays for the church at Ephesus, that they might be filled with the, the knowledge of God's will, um, and let's have a look at there quickly. I'll just quickly turn there. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, this is the prayer that he prays for them. And, he, and he's praying that, for example, he says in verse uh, 8, it says, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And if you go down into the prayer that he prays, that he says in verse 16, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of, lowercase s, spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, etc. goes on. This thing that he's talking about is possessing the wisdom of God right now, possessing this understanding, know what God is saying, understand the direction of the Spirit, understand that, be able to unlock Bible prophecy, know the truth, attain unto wise counsels. This is the promise of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Okay, so what we want to do now is see this in its prophetical outworking through history. I'll mention to you briefly that the prophecy has its origins and its foundation with what happened with King Hezekiah back in the Old Testament. And to look at that, let's actually look at the book of Joel, because the book of Joel is, is very key for us if we tie together you know, the prophecies of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah is very much about this area of prophecy, but the prophecy in Joel is telling us about something called the outpouring of spirit. And we've just said and seen in these verses we've looked at in Proverbs and in Ephesians that essentially spirit, or what God wills, and what's relevant for this time, is a spirit of wisdom or people to be wise and know and understand. So we're lo looking at really what does that actually mean. Well, if you look in Ephesians chapter 4 you would find out he's talking about actually understanding biblical doctrines properly coming into a full measure of the stature of the knowledge of Christ, coming into, you know, knowing Bible doctrine, knowing how to interpret Scripture, knowing not only what are Bible doctrines, you know, the Trinity and different Bible doctrines, but then having actually correct views in all those areas. We're told, and, and this is sort of in passing, but it is actually central to the whole um, conclusion of all this, we're told that there's many different denominations and people, many people say, oh, well, you know, no one, ever, no one has a monopoly on truth and no one can come to a full understanding and there's not going to be really agreement. Well, we can say categorically that's wrong. Bible prophecy is talking about people coming together in commonality of having a true set of beliefs. That's actually what wisdom is. Because if every person everywhere is being outpoured upon by the same spirit the Holy Ghost, then the work of spirit, the wisdom, should be one set of wisdom, right? Yes, it's multifaceted. Yes, there's lots of different um, aspects of the knowledge, but there's one central, you know, true doctrine, so to speak, or, or set of doctrines, and that should be commonly uh, testified and commonly acknowledged. So that's what we're working towards. We're working towards the unity of faith, as Ephesians chapter 4 prophesies. So we're looking here in the book of Joel, and in Joel chapter 2, let's start in Joel chapter 2 um, looking uh, at the prophecy when he talks about what happens in verse 20. He says, But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savour shall come up, because he hath done great things. 
So in Bible prophecy, what we need to do is understand that there's kind of a layering or a double meaning or a double fulfillment or multiple fulfillments. So let's first see it in the historical um, past context of what happened and, and how these things came to pass. So we know for a fact, when we look in Isaiah, and you can also read about it in, you know, like uh, Chronicles, Second Chronicles, whatever, you can see this whole story about Hezekiah. And what happened with Hezekiah was Hezekiah was, um, there was the kingdom of, of Israel, which was headed by Samaria, and there was King Hezekiah, who was king in Jerusalem, in Judah. And the Assyrians came and took Samaria, and that was the end of Israel. And they went into captivity. And so here's, here's Hezekiah with the Jews at Jerusalem and in Judea, or Judah as it was called, and they're an island in the middle of this great Assyrian Empire. And then you find this story and you see that it's prophesied about in, in Isaiah and you also see the, the history of it happening as recorded in the Bible. You see that the Assyrians come to take over uh, Judah and they begin... They begin to besiege cities in Judah because there's now a war going against King Hezekiah. And the war comes more and more desperate. They send messengers to, to mock and to tell him basically to surrender. And it's going to get pretty desperate. And we know what happens is that in a night time, an angel comes and just kills like their besieging army. And there's a total uh, defeat in that way of the Assyrians and Hezekiah uh, becomes a, a great sort of hero and is recognised. Now that, in that way, is a deliverance from a northern army, as it were, and a deliverance for, for King Hezekiah, for the Jews. And after that, yes, Nebuchadnezzar comes, yes, they go into captivity, but then you see what happens... There's prophecies about this. They come out of captivity. For example, Joel 3 verse 1 says, For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, etc. So you see that there's this view in Bible prophecy in Jeremiah and so on. You see it happening, referred to in Daniel, that there's you know, King Cyrus and the return of the Jews and they begin to rebuild and you see other things happen and that leads eventually to, you know, the Greeks come and then the Romans come. We, we know this from our history and then Jesus comes and what's really important is that when Jesus rises again and then ascends, then the Holy Ghost comes and that's the start of church history as we know it um, till today. Now that's really important because that puts into a timeline even King Hezekiah and the events that happen after to until Pentecost and until today. And that's really important because this will show now as we see uh, this famous prophecy in Joel chapter 2 verse 28 it says and it shall come to pass afterward this is after uh, that the Assyrian had been defeated and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and all the time when he says spirit here it's got a lowercase s and we know from what we have been talking about that that's talking about you know spirit is like the wisdom of God and it's the working of God. But wisdom of God is an important component because the people who have spirit, the spirit, which is a spirit of God, and it tells us here um, that very, the very terminology which uh, is here, my spirit, okay? So spirit of God, my spirit, that this spirit manifests in and is is possessed by so to speak or is used by or is attained by those who are 
the wise. So, so we'll see that because after all, if you've got prophecy, you've got what? You've got an income knowledge stream from the Spirit of God. That's going to be insight, revelation, right? That will make you wise in, in the sense of you'll have knowledge about things. When you see uh, people prophesying and dreaming dreams and so on, it means a waking up of, of knowledge of what does it mean to be a believer coming to a higher level. Verse 29, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So he's giving this prophecy, which once we understand about multiple fulfillments and understand about the future application of it, then we begin to see how this fits into actual world history. Now I've talked about the Assyrian and what happened, and you can see different things like, you know, um, Cyrus and, and the Persian kings give authority for the Jews to come back and rebuild Jerusalem. And then you go through the history that goes beyond the, biblic, the Old Testament um, recorded history into what happened when the Greeks came, what happened when the Romans came. And then you re- restart New Testament history with the coming of Christ and then his death and resurrection and ascension. This is all very important because now let's have a look how this first fulfillment came to the point of where it actually was realized or manifested. So you see it in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, Peter recognizes that the day of Pentecost is a fulfillment or part of the fulfillment of that prophecy. Because it says there in Acts 2, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and so on and so on. And there was the outpouring of the Spirit. And then when Peter gets to preach and explain what's going on, he quotes directly from Joel and talks about what this is. Verse 16. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit. Now notice there, it uses the word spirit with a capital S, and it says, of my spirit. So before he's saying, I pour out my spirit with a lowercase s, meaning a pouring out of this, and we're tying it specifically to the wisdom that the wise have, that's our emphasis in this, But here we see that it's of the Holy Ghost. Now this is really important because we cannot receive or have any future outpouring of spirit or have the wise in the future without the Holy Ghost having come on the day of Pentecost to begin the fulfillment of this prophecy to start with. In other words, we can't have the spiritually wise with the you know, prophecies and dreams and visions and, and outpouring of, of or ability to access godly wisdom in its fullest sense without the Holy Ghost having come in on the day of Pentecost. So clearly, when Peter's preaching there on the day of Pentecost, he's saying that's a fulfillment and that this is that. This is the fulfillment. And he, and he quotes that prophecy and he says, verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and moon into blood before that great 
and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now let me just incidentally mention that these signs can be both figurative and literal. For example, literally, you can have a time of darkness and uh, in a future fulfilment of this, one of the things with the Gog invasion is you may see a time of darkness like this. Also, people point to and say, well, you know, in the future tribulation, there'll be that. So there's definitely two there, two possible phys- physical times of fulfillment. Also, though, figuratively. So when it says the sun shall return into darkness, for example, we find in the historicist interpretation of Revelation, it does talk about the sun. And in that case, it's talking about the French, we'll say, leadership. Um, And it says, sun shall return darkness, moon into blood. Well, for example, the moon is a symbol for, uh, just in a symbolical kind of sense, we know it's a a symbol for Islam. So the fact, for example, of the moon being turned to blood, um, indeed is a symbol about the, the waning and demise of Islam and, you know, literally destruction and blood upon it so this this can be in that way a figurative uh, prophecy now that's all well and and quite you know probable in, in different respects but also what we're seeing is that what happened there on the day of Pentecost is not just referring to that time when was the sun turned to darkness or moon blood in the days of Peter the Apostle. It really is not just a first century prophecy, is it? It's clearly talking about afterward as well. So what we come to understand is what the Pentecostal people understood in, we see in the 1900s, so in the late um, 19th century, that's the late 1800s, and coming into the uh, 20th century, that's the 1900s, that people were understanding and receiving then of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost a new or a fresh because there'd been a lot of years where there really wasn't the sign of tongues being shown. You see it in the first century, but it sort of went away eventually and then it had to come back. And what's brought it back? Well, the Pentecostal movement, the Pentecostal revival has brought that back. Well, that's great. That's, that's really good. And the Pentecostal revival people indeed in Pentecostal churches they've been preaching I certainly heard it being preached this very passage about the outpouring of Spirit of God the outpouring of the Holy Ghost they believe that and that's been preached that's been seen in the in the 20th century we're living beyond in that today what I want to do is address a doctrine about Should we defer it all into the future? You see, in in the Pentecostals, what they used to do when the Pentecostal revival started, and this is, um, you know, like in the early 1900s, is what they would say, and, and it happened for years, they would do this, they would say, you know, sister so and so, brother so and so, they're earnestly seeking the infilling of the Spirit, and they would be having prayer meetings, and you know, they'd be lifting their hands and say, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, you know, I, I, I want to receive the Spirit of God. And th- what they would be doing is they'd have these even meetings where they would be waiting for the Spirit of God to fill them. And they called those tarrying meetings. And that was, of course, based on this idea of Jesus told the disciples to tarry at Jerusalem till the Holy Ghost came. So people would be doing that. Now, that tied into the holiness doctrine idea as well, because it said you sort of have to get the vessel, your life, you know, prepared for the Holy Ghost. Now, there's an element of truth to that. You know, you've got to be ready, you've got to be ready for the Holy Ghost. You've got to be ready to receive. But it was actually word of faith people, and I know that Kenneth Hagen taught it, and there was others teaching it as well, and it only really came later down the track, maybe in the, the 1960s or 70s, came prominent, a long, long time later, 
So that's like 60, 70 years afterwards where it came known in Pentecost that you could receive the Holy Ghost. You know, Kenneth Hagin taught this. I think it was he that had the revelation really about it. You don't have to wait and tarry for the Holy Ghost. If you receive it by faith, it can be very quick. And, you know, then after that, and it became more common that people could receive the Holy Ghost very quickly. So they didn't have to tarry for something. If he's being given, he's there to be received, right? And uh, we have to be ready, but that can be very quick. So people can be filled with the Holy Ghost. In fact, in the Bible, it was so quick. When Peter preached with Cornelius, he barely got time to to go through the sermon and and everything, and they were talking in tongues. So then he said, well, you know, who can forbid them to be water baptised? You see, (laughs) it's not a matter of us trying to get the Holy Ghost to move, to be filled with the Spirit, but rather the Spirit is ready and uh, we have to align to, to that readiness. You know, Smith Wigglesworth, he talked about, it's not really about us trying to, to uh, wait, you know, we're, we're just waiting for the Spirit of God to move us to get somewhere. He said, basically, he steps out and the Holy Ghost gives the enablement. I'm just paraphrasing that. But it's, it's, really, it's really the believer who moves, the minister who moves, and, and there's power there. And uh, that, that's very important. As um, Kenneth Hagin said, you can't receive the Holy Ghost if, basically if you keep your mouth closed. Now, um, in other words, you have to be... There has to be an opening of the, the mouth to speak. There has to be that opening. Um, so it's very important for that step to be taken. It's a faith step. You don't say, well, I'm going to let the, you know, receive the feeling of the Holy Ghost, but I'm just going to completely remain still and, and completely not move my mouth or anything like that. It doesn't work like that. And we know that because it says that he giveth, giveth the utterance. He giveth the utterance. So in other words, you've got, to, you've got a mouth, you've got a will, you've got to let yourself uh, be the vessel. But, but if you receive from him, if you're receiving him, you have faith that you do speak in a tongue. And instead of being just praising God and speaking English, the tongues start. You know, that happened to me. And I pray it's happened to you too. So that's the important first step here is we are not waiting for a future outpouring of the Spirit. We don't have to wait till, you know, Gog and Gog's armies are defeated and there's this great sort of event in world history um, and that, that's coming up in Bible prophecy. We don't have to wait for that to receive of the outpouring of the Spirit of God in its final outpouring. And many people, and people do understand that, but many people are not seeing and realising the day of Pentecost already happened, the Holy Ghost is already here. We're not waiting for the Holy Ghost to be here. He's already present. Why do we have to wait until then, till after Gog is defeated, to be filled with the Holy Ghost or to have an outpouring of the Spirit? We can and should walk in it right now are you ready are you ready to walk in the outpouring of the spirit now today okay so let's let's establish some more here so as i said if the outpouring already happened in acts 2 acts 2 is our history we already have the holy ghost here today the reviving of pentecostalism happened in 1900 and has happened through the 20th century that's already here then he's here today. You know, the, the, the Pentecostal movement's here, so he's here today. The Word of Faith movement's here, so he's here today. The Word and Spirit movement's here, so he's here today. We are in it now. We're not waiting for, you know, five years, five minutes. We are in it now. You know, Isaiah chapter 60 says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. We're not waiting for Christ to come. We're not waiting for the Holy Ghost to move. It's already here. 
We already have Christ in us. He already is a risen Christ in our lives. So we're not waiting for salvation to come. The salvation is here. We're not waiting for an outpouring to come or a refreshing to come. We can already have it now. It's here. I want you to believe that because that's like believing a harvest. If the seeds were sown at Pentecost or or begun even to be reaped at Pentecost and was even more reaping going on like a latter rain with the Pentecostal revival in the 1900s, then what do you get when you come to former and latter rain together? What, where should we be now in the scheme of things? We are at the advance. We are at the final level already now. We don't have to wait for the Gog uh, destruction for, for the outpouring of spirit. It's already available. Now, yes, it's promised for that time, but we can have it today, right now. Okay, so in Isaiah 60, it says that there's darkness and there's light. In fact, I I will go there quickly and just look at that. Isaiah 60, and he says, Behold, gross darkness shall cover the people. Let me just get there in Isaiah chapter 60. Because what we're seeing is it's a present time available blessing. He says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Notice that he says, Arise, shine. That's not one day arise and shine. That's not one day thy light is going to come. He says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. That's present right now. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Now we step out by faith in this. It's not because we've seen it. It's not because we've experienced it. We step out in this now today because it is now at this time. He is come. He is here. We are in the outpouring of the Spirit already. So... Let's just see here, it says about darkness covering the earth. If the works of history of man, of the world, are getting darker, the opposite to that should be that God's outworking of his church should be getting lighter, right? Now, if that's true, then the church can't be going down the gurgler down the hill right now. It must be also having its advance, its remnant at least, must be here coming into the highest levels. We cannot have a church today, an outpouring or a a movement that says it's Pentecostal or word of faith or word and spirit. We cannot be at this level of Christianity today only to have no one entering into that level. We cannot say, now the Bible is true and it says darkness shall cover the earth and there be no light, no real light. Now granted that word Word of Faith Ministries are doing a lot to proclaim light. They've had their television shows and, you know, Keith Moore's got his things online for free. That's really great. But we need a greater witness than that. As good as those many materials can be, as good as, you know, there's a lot of good teachings there, we've got to go beyond that because this level of light has to contrast the great darkness of the world. And the promise ultimately is an outpouring upon all flesh. In other words, it's not just uh, great light for one person, but for many. And so we are at that level now. Well, there has to be this manifestation of this light. There has to be this thing where we see the light of God shining in this darkened world. Let's now look in the book of Daniel because I want to tie this together to the reality of the Bible prophecy that is showing what is happening not only when Gog is defeated, but first of all, before and when Gog is even on the rise. And once you see this, you will see that we must be walking in the Spirit and let us receive and go up and be the lights in the world today. Okay, so Daniel chapter 11, 
is a prophecy about what's called Eastern Antichrist. There is a prophecy part portion of it. First of all, the first part of that chapter, the first half of that chapter, is talking about the different Greek kingdoms that came after Alexander the Great. And it specifically talks about the uh, kingdom of the Seleucids and the kingdom of the Ptolemies, which was in Egypt. The Seleucids were in Syria. And that's called the king of the north, the king of the south being Egypt. And they were in this conflict together and different events and things happened. That's what this prophecy lays out. But we come to a point in the prophecy where you see that there'll be multiple fulfillments, whether it's talking about someone called Antiochus Epiphanes and what he did. And there's a whole story there, I'm not going into it. Or whether it's talking about a historical fulfillment through uh, the church times of history, which is basically a prophecy about Islam, or else a future fulfillment of this prophecy which talks about Gog. And it is in that context of the fullness or the fulfilment, the ultimate fulfilment of this prophecy that we come to now. And that's why it says in uh, Daniel chapter 11 verse 30, it says, for the ships of Chittim, so that could be, for example, Mediterranean sea fleet ships. It could mean, of course, NATO ships, whatever. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved. It's talking about the northern, uh, northern king, that's the eastern Antichrist, which is Gog. And you can read about the Gog prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. But he shall be grieved and shall return, have indignation against the holy covenant, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Now, a lot of people have confused Eastern Antichrist and Western Antichrist, and they read this as a prophecy about the Western Antichrist and what he's going to be doing, apparently. But they've mistaken this whole thing about, you know, uh, you know, this idea of Western Antichrist making a covenant and then breaking it halfway through seven years. That's all irrelevant to what we're talking about. Now, whether or not that's true or anything or anything to do with that, this that doesn't count in this. This is a completely different story. It's a completely different prophecy. This prophecy is about Eastern Antichrist and what Eastern Antichrist does. So when Eastern Antichrist says he's an indignation against the Holy Covenant, he's talking about Eastern Antichrist is against Scripture. Eastern Antichrist is against the truth of Bible prophecy. That's what it's talking about. It's nothing to do with some covenant made with the Jews or anything like that. That's a, that's a totally different prophecy. It's different terminology even. It's nothing to do with what this is talking about. So he has indignation against the Holy Covenant. In other words, what you saw Antiochus Epiphanes do in his fight against the Jews at Jerusalem is a type of what Gog is to do, not, fig- not literally, but figuratively. So whilst Antiochus Epiphanes himself didn't, but rather mainly had an underling do in fighting against the believers in Jerusalem, so likewise Gog will be fighting against the truth in, in, a, in a figurative, ideological way, but also we know with, with military things in certain countries. And in fact, it looks very much like what we would call World War III if you were to apply it and see that it's imminently uh, to happen in world history. Okay, so this is what we find in verse 30 and verse 31 it says and arms shall stand on his part that's on the part of Russia and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength what's obviously an ideological attack on the true church or believers and they shall take away the daily sacrifice spiritually that means proper understanding about prayer and so on and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries So notice that this is not direct warfare uh, against Christians, like um, I'm coming to get you specifically deliberately, but rather the the use of ideological weapons, in this case, flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. This is the type of Gog. 
Well, who's here in the time of Gog? Well, the church is. Christians are. And do Christians understand? Yes. Why? Because we've got the Spirit of God and we have you know, the wisdom of Christianity and so on. But it's actually about there's already people who possess this outworking or, or pouring out of God's Spirit. He's, he's talked about the Spirit of Wisdom. Who are the wise? Well, that's us. Believers. Strong. Wise. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many... Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity by spo- and by spoil, many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Well, that sounds like social media too, doesn't it? And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvellous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. And on it goes. This is a prophecy about Gog, the Eastern Antichrist. It is not a prophecy about Western Antichrist, which also the Bible has plenty to say about. Eastern Antichrist is at war with the idea of biblical determinism. He's at, he's at war with the idea that you could understand, know the Bible, that it's reliable, that it's true. It is in every way an ideological war about the truth of what this message is about Protestant Christianity versus some other philosophical view and his personal exaltation, self-exaltation. You can see very clearly that God is saying that he's in control of history. That's the very doctrine, obviously, that he's fighting against. You see, he's about himself. He's about what he wants, what he decrees. But God has, of course, declared the end from the beginning. And it says in verse 35, and some of them of understanding shall fall. Now, clearly there are people who understand, believers. Now, some are going to fall. Yes, there is a trying and purging. Yes, there are things that people need to deal with in order to make sure that they're going to be consistent with the wisdom of God. But that's by far preferable than you know, having wrong doctrine and, and only staying in wrong doctrine. God is at work to make sure that the people of God are strong. God is at work to make sure there's a remnant. God is at work to make sure there is the wise. God is at work to make sure that even if there's persecutions against some of the wise, we see some of the wise have bad things happen. Yet, nevertheless, the wise that are able to stand and be a witness are able to do so. Why? Because there is this thing called the outpouring of Spirit, the Spirit of God. And they are able to do it because God has worked through history to this point to bring about the accruing of knowledge that it makes it available for these people and that the Holy Ghost is present, real and at work. Are we ready today to be the wise today? Are we ready today to be willing to hear and to be at the level of, you know, signs and wonders and prophecies? You see, that's all possible. That's not, oh well, back in the Pentecostal revival, back in the day of the apostles, one day in the future, after the Gog invasion, or in the millennial reign of Christ, it'll be heaven on earth. Wonderful. But do you know, this is talking about now, in this time. We shouldn't be just looking back and say, well, Smith Wigglesworth or Kenneth Hagin or someone in the past, they had all these things. We shouldn't be looking and saying, well, one day in the future, when Gog falls, then there'll be an outpouring of the Spirit of God, which is true. That's, that is a Bible prophecy. And you can see that in Ezekiel 39, it actually says that, that the outpouring of the Spirit is there basically for Jews to get converted and for the heathen to know. So we know there's great evangelistic outpouring then, but that didn't come out of nowhere. What is the linchpin or the thing that ties together, say, the Pentecostalism of the 20th century with the outpouring of the Spirit after the fall of Gog. Well, the only thing that ties it together 
besides the Holy Ghost being ever present, is that there is a remnant of believers who are the wise, who are strong, who are white, who are you know, walking in the spiritual gifts, walking in the things of wisdom and, and understanding. This means we are a people called of God. We are a people who are empowered to be at this level. That is a very important message. And that's a very important understanding of what it means to walk in the Spirit and to be of the Spirit of God, to not only have an understanding about who's the Holy Ghost and you know what's he doing, but to have that knowledge in you. Because the Holy Ghost isn't just a person who, you know, is there. He's obviously, there's things to do in your Christian ministry. Well, what enables that? What gives you understanding? What's the actual substance of that understanding? Is obviously the product, so to speak, of the Holy Ghost. We need to be receivers and walkers in and reapers of this spirit, this wisdom of God and the other attributes, the prophecy, the, the other spiritual aspects of this truth. We need to walk in the spirit of revelation and knowledge of him. Are you ready today to receive that? You know, Paul prayed that for the Ephesians. Kenneth Hagin used to pray it. I know that other faith ministries pray that. And you need to believe that God actually is giving you enlightenment of the eyes. Your intelligence level can exceed high, very high. Your understanding of scripture, your ability to interpret, your ability to access um, prophetical understanding, it can open right up. Not just a little. We shouldn't be just aiming for 30-fold Christianity. 30-fold Christianity is pretty powerful, you understand. In a time of darkness, to have just even virtually one-fold Christianity is, seems like a miracle. You know, when it's so dark and, oh, it's so hard to share the gospel, to hold on to your faith seems like it's a daily miracle. My brethren, my friends, that ought not to be so. It ought not be so because Jesus spoke about 30-fold Christianity. Are we going to be game enough to live at 30-fold Christianity? The Bible didn't just say 30-fold. He said some 30, some 60, some 100. Are you ready to actually go to the maximum, the maximal level? Are you ready for 100-fold Christianity? We're living in a time of, as I said, like one-fold Christianity. In fact, almost like folding Christianity, like, oh, I fold. That, that's what it's like. But we're not walking by sight. We're not walking after what we see with our eyes. The Bible tells us that God's servant doesn't walk like that. He doesn't walk after what he sees with his eyes. How does he walk? He walks after what he knows from the Spirit of God. That's a prophecy in Isaiah. That's a wonderful blessing for us. We, we're not people who are relying on what we see ourselves, what we know of ourselves. This whole working of the Spirit, everything about it is about what is God doing? What is His enablement? The Bible says, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit saith the Lord. This is what he does. I want to read to you from Isaiah chapter 42 as we come to a close and conclusion here. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit, notice the lowercase s spirit, upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Do we believe that? Such an outpouring work to bring about a knowledge and understanding among the people. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause 
his voice to be heard in the street. Now, people understand this is a prophecy about Jesus in his first coming. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. That's, of course, describing where Christianity is at today, too. It's like the fire has gone out, it's almost at a breaking point, the fire's almost, you know, it's a smoking now, the reed is almost broken. The reed's like a stick or a, or a, or a, um, a, a leaf of a reed of a plant. But it says, He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. God is a God of recompense. He's a God of restitution. That which is stolen, that which has been um, destroyed, not only has to be returned, but returned more than what has been taken. That is what we're walking. We're walking in a, a not only a wealth transfer, but a wisdom and an understanding and an empowerment transfer. Verse 4. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Do you realise that there's a promise for people to be ready to receive and hear the word of God? There's a promise that's telling us even where on earth God is able to have a receptive audience. It says here the isles shall wait for his law. God is able to get through. He has his people. He has the wisdom. He has the place. Many other prophecies. Here, if you just keep reading these different chapters in Isaiah, from chapter, you know, chapter 40, chapter 41, 42, 43, and different other passages, 46, and different verse, uh, chapters and verses, you can see it over and again, and here and there, and other parts of the Bible. God is coming not only with a recompense, but there's a restitution for the people of God. That's not just a post-Gog restitution, which is a great restitution. It's not just, of course, a millennial restitution, which is the fullness of restitution. But it's a restitution that we're already able to enter into today. If you walk by faith, you're not saying, I one day will have it. Because faith says, now faith is. It says, I have believed, therefore have I spoken. It's now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. And now is the acceptable year of the Lord. It is now. Are you ready to receive right now, today, an outpouring of the Spirit and a work of the Spirit in your life to activate your Christian ministry, to bring you up to another level, to get your heart in alignment, to have a desire of the love of God, to get the sanctification issues dealt with, to have your life put in order, and all kinds of things outworking if you but receive of the Spirit of God today. It's a crucial decision. It's a crucial thing. Are you ready to receive from the Spirit of God, not to defer, not to say, as many Pentecostals have said, God is coming with a great, you know, the great revelation, the great restitution, the great restoration, the great outpouring. God is coming to outpour. He's raising up an army. They've said all these things. You know, we believe in revival, they've said. God is coming to revive his people. We're not waiting for a revival. We're not waiting for some great move of God where signs and wonders and people falling over and healings in the street and hospitals emptying out and you know people being raised from the dead we're not waiting for some future outpouring for that which all is wonderful good and even true but today we can already walk in it we don't have to wait for the spirit of god to do something or some great event in history to occur and then oh well now it's come Now let's get into the the things of God. My friends, why wait till then? Why not be a witness today and be a walker in the wisdom of God right now, this hour, this moment? Why not take hold 
of the promises of the word of God and walk by faith consistently in what he's called us to do. If you're ready today to receive, to come up to the higher level and to walk in these new things today, things that have been prophesied of old, might I add, they're not new and strange in that sense, but yet it's a strange thing. The Bible calls it a strange thing. And he says, a short work shall he make. There's many prophecies. People say, well, this sounds like an unusual message. It sounds like it, it is a strange work. You know, he says that. He actually describes that in Isaiah. It, it, it seems very unusual because everyone's been, anyone who's been waiting has been deferring off when the great revival comes. We want it to come. I've heard word of faith ministers, preachers saying, oh yes, we're in the edges of it right now. We're not here to concoct an outpouring of the Spirit of God. We're not here to try to whip it up. And I'm not accusing them necessarily of, of, of being fakes. But it's actually available as a reality right now. Because the Holy Ghost is actually here. His wisdom, his understanding is accessible now. You want to have knowledge, you want to know what the Bible says, you want to understand what the Spirit of God is saying now. You realise when he spoke to the churches, for example, it says Jesus is telling the later scenes to repent. He's speaking now, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's present tense. That's not one day we'll hear what the Spirit says or one day he'll speak. Now he's been speaking. He is speaking. It's not one day he's outpouring his spirit. Not one day there is prophecy and signs and miracles and understanding. Today is the acceptable, acceptable day. It's an acceptable time. The day is now. The hour is now. The time has come. And so we need to give heed. I want to close with a prophecy for us it's in Isaiah 28 and in Isaiah 28 it says I'll just read from verse 21 for the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon that he may do his work his strange work and bring to pass his act his strange act. Now, he's talking, of course, about the Gog destruction, the destruction of Magog. Verse 22, Now, therefore, be ye not mockers, lest your hands be made strong, lest your bands be made strong. And no, that, that's people that are outside of Christ, of course. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption even determined upon the whole earth. But what did he say then? In the very next verse, he gives what is the solution to that. He gives a solution, which is this. Give ye ear and hear my voice, hearken and hear my speech. Do you think you'd be wise if you did that? Are you ready to be wise today? Are you ready to walk in the wisdom of God? Are you ready to receive from the Holy Ghost? You know, in the book of James, it actually says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, he giveth liberally and upbraideth not. Now, we're not just talking about that, but that's the principle of using faith, receiving and knowing. We're talking about today about, are you ready to receive of the Spirit of God, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost? Are you ready to receive that today? Well, let's not defer, let's not wait a moment longer, let's receive by faith right now let's pray Father in the name of Jesus I pray that hearts will be open right now to receive of an outpouring of the spirit of God the mighty and latter days outpouring not a deferred outpouring but a present outpouring we listen to the spirit of God we receive of it right now I receive in my life, and you receive in your life right now, 
by faith in the name of Jesus. The Holy Ghost outpouring, what began on the day of Pentecost, has not gone away. What happened in the Pentecostal revival has not gone away. What happened when we were ourselves filled with the Holy Ghost and became believers has not gone away. We are building forth, going forth, building more, going beyond. And we're ready to receive of the great last day's outpouring of the Spirit in its fullest measure. Use us, I pray, Lord. Fill us with wisdom and understanding and knowledge. All the attributes of Spirit, spiritual attributes. These are the things of the Spirit of God. God is opening our eyes, eyes of faith, to see that His outpouring is here. His dispensing of His outpouring is at hand. Let us receive it. Receive it in a full measure, even now, in Jesus' name. Receive the outpouring of the Spirit. Receive it now, in Jesus' name. Amen.